great. Uh, you must have had your Red Bulls. Good job. Uh, we, did, uh, we did hand out monster drinks to the uh, 8.30 service. This is a rough weekend, you know, uh, daylight savings time. and Plus, most of the people that come at 8.30, in any way, so they're... Uh, no, I was, so, uh, yeah, I think there's a few monster drinks still left out there. If you, if, uh, if you need help during the message, um, I'll pray here in a second. No, you can... You're welcome to go get it. I had my first one today, so this, uh, this message is going to be fast and short. Uh, I love watching Deal or No Deal. I think it's a hilarious show. Uh, we're in a game show series, uh, and uh, we're, ans- we're answering some of the tough questions in the Old Testament. And we've been dealing this for several weeks now, and, and today is Deal or No Deal. I think uh, Howie Mandel is hilarious. I just love that whole deal. And and people on that show are, are just stupid. They are. They're just dumb, right? Because they 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 are convinced that they you know that they're going to pick the right suitcase, and and because they've studied you know and they've um, researched, and uh, no, they have absolutely they have no idea what they're doing, right? They're just picking a number. This is my kid's favorite number. This, is my, you know, they don't know. And, and so they start eliminating things, and the numbers keep going up. Like, hey, you know, we're going to give you $25,000 if you stop right now. And they're like, no deal, right? And it's like, no deal, I'm not doing that. And uh, so then it goes up a little higher and higher, and, and uh, you know, there's like a hundred grand out there. And people, you know, like, I'm thinking, just push the button, push the button. That's a hundred thousand dollars. And and they're looking over at their relatives and their friends and their friends like no deal because <laughs> you know what because they, they're, they're they're idiots too right they don't, they don't have no idea they have no idea what's in that suitcase but they're all convinced that they have somehow magically made the best decision possible picking out that million or five hundred thousand dollars they know they know they know and then the, and, and then they just keep going and eventually they find out that they picked a five dollar suitcase. And, um, and that's really, uh, you know, it's kind of a little microcosm of how oftentimes we make decisions and do life, right? It's because we think, hey, you know, we're just going to randomly, you know, without thinking. We're just, in, in fact, I hear this all the time. I'm going uh, to just trust my gut on this. Well, maybe you just ate at Taco Bell. Maybe that's what's going on in your gut right now. You're like, oh, my gut's telling me. Yeah, hmm. Mm, too many burritos. Now, that's what your gut is telling you. Or you're going to trust some people like, hey, what do you think? What do you think? I don't know, dude. I don't know. Just go for it. Just go for it. Do it. Hey, follow your dream. Like, what? You want me to be a, like, what? Yeah, I do it. All right. And, uh, and, and they're, they don't, they're, they're really not even invested in the whole deal. They don't really care, right? They just think, you know, hey, you do what, Whatever. And so we, we make these decisions based on our feelings or based on a gut deal. And then oftentimes we was like, oh, I just want to be happy. And, and, and again, um, we end up with, with, kind of, with nothing. We're just not, whole, not a whole lot there. And so um, we're going to take a look at today some, some guys who, who didn't do so well in the deal or no deal thing, you know, making decisions mostly based on their gut based on the fact that they were hungry, based on the fact that they are greedy. And, um, and again, we oftentimes make decisions, poor decisions based on, oh, my, I'm, I'm you know, hungry or I, um, I, I want stuff. And so we're going to take a look at this um, today, uh, this story in the Old Testament. Again, uh, these guys are growing up in a very, very uh, messed up home. Uh, they, uh, it is dysfunction after dysfunction. So uh, now they're twins, and, and they're opposite. They're just completely opposite. One is a manly man. Uh, he loves to hunt. He loves to fish. Uh, he, uh, he smells like he hunts. Um, by the way, if you're spraying urine on you so that you can hunt better, what is, what is wrong with you? You know, I got friends like they'll go elk hunting and they get some sort of, sort of like stuff from Cabela's that you can spray on you so that you'll smell like elk urine. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Now, that's a difficult, I mean, you know, you can go into Dillard's or something and people are spraying stuff on you all the time. But if you go to Cabela's, they're spraying stuff on you, run! They're like, get out of there. Like, whoa, hey, whoa, hey, don't be spraying that stuff on me. 
But guys will do that. Like, hey, I want to, you know, so I'm, I'm stealth. I'm getting out there. So, like, you know, uh, when the elk smells me, they're like, hmm, wonder what that is. All right. Um, th- but this guy's a manly man. He, he loves to cook. He loves the outdoors. He probably drives a Ford F-150 Raptor. I mean, this guy's a manly man. He's hairy. He's the Duck Dynasty dude. He's just out there. Now, his brother, his twin brother, is just completely opposite. He's kind of a mama's boy. Likes hanging around house. He doesn't even know how to cook. He smells good. Um, he, uh, he probably drives a Mini Cooper. You know, no big deal. Just saying. <laughs> All right. You don't believe me? Let's read. Genesis 27. It's in the Bible. <laughs> One day when Isaac was old, this is daddy. Dad's old and he's turning blind. He calls for Esau, his, his oldest son. First one out. Uh, says, my son, yes, father, I am old now. And I don't know when I may die. Take your bow and quiver full of arrows. Go out into the open country. Hunt some wild game for me. Prepare my favorite dish. Bring it here for me to eat. Then I will pronounce the blessing that uh, belongs to you, my firstborn son, before I die. So Isaac's old. He thinks he's going to die. He's 100 years old. He's leaking oil, right? He's just uh, Parts are breaking down, and he thinks as th- he's living in his last days. Uh, truth is, he's not near death. He thinks he is, but he's not near death. He's going to live another 80 years but he thinks he's dying, and he's losing his eyesight, and he wants a really good meal. It's, you know, it's like, this may be it. This may be it, Esau. Why don't you give, give me some good food, right? Now I was thinking, what would I want if it was my last meal? If I was thinking, this is it, right? And I definitely know what I would want. I want my mom to cook me um, a fried chicken and mashed potatoes and gravy and, su- and sweet corn, right? And and because I don't care. It's my last meal. I don't care about health at this moment. It's like, gr- fry it up. Uh, you know, that'd be great. And I, I love that. I love my mom's cooking. And, and uh, I think that'd be awesome. Um, and then for dessert, I would want bacon. And so, <laughs> so Isaac asked his son to get him some good meat. He's going to give him a blessing. It's a prophetic promise. This is a prophetic promise that comes from, his, from the dad, and it is honored by God. Uh, all throughout the Old Testament, we see that the blessing was something that was sought after and desired. Uh, God blessed, and, and uh, fathers would bless their sons. It was a prophetic message that was, that was a f- promising future for their kid, and it was handed down from dad uh, to, to their son. Uh, so here uh, he gives instruction to his boy, and he's doing it kind of quietly, kind of stealth-like. Um, but there's somebody listening, Genesis 27, 5. But Rebekah, uh, be Isaac's wife, overheard what Isaac had said to his son, Esau. So when Esau left to hunt for wild game, she said to her son, Jacob, listen, I overhear your father say to Esau, bring me some wild game and prepare me a delicious meal. Then I will bless you in the Lord's presence before I die. Now, my son, listen to me. Do exactly as I tell you. Go out in the flocks and bring me two fine goats. I'll use them to prepare my father's, your father's favorite dish. Then take you the food to your father so he can eat it and bless you before he dies. But look, Jacob replied to Rebekah, my, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and my skin is sm- silky smooth. Um, what if my father touches me? He'll see that I'm trying to trick him, and then he'll curse me instead of blessing me. But his mother replied, let the curse fall on me. My son, just do what I tell you. Go out and get the goats for me. Now, oftentimes I thought well, these guys are little, you know, they're like teenagers or, you know, they're just, um, you know, maybe in their early 20s or something. Um, but no, they're, 50, they're probably 50 years old at this point. And here's mama telling her boy what to do. And, you know, and uh, she comes up with a plan and she's reminding them, you know. She, and again, let me just remind you of what happens to people when they take matters into their own hands and, and, and don't follow God's plan. How well did that work out for Eve? Not so good. How well did that work out for Cain when he decided, I'm going to take matters in my own hands, and he killed his brother? 
So Jacob complains, Mom, we're never going to be able to pull this off. I'm not hairy. I, I, I'm not a hunter. I'm not a good cook. And Mom kept saying, no problem, no problem. She's the classic enabler, right? She's the classic manipulator. I'm going to make sure that my favorite boy is going to get this. So don't worry about being, uh, you know, your, your skin's not hairy. Uh, we're going to take some animal skin. We're going to put it on you, and you're going to feel like Chewbacca at this point. And you're just like, hey, whoa. All right, and then I'm going to cook up some, uh, go get your pet goat, because he obviously can't go hunt, so he has to go get his pet goat. And he goes and gets his pet goat, and they kill it, and they make this great meal, and it smells good, and, and it, you know, and, and still he's like, hey, you know, I'm still worried that if he finds out, don't worry about it. Uh, and so she tells, she tells her son, just obey me. Uh, dis- we're going to disobey God, but just obey me. And she dresses him up and, and uh, uh, cooks the meal for him. So here in Genesis 27, 14, it says, Jacob went out, got the young goats for his mom. Rebekah took them and prepared a delicious meal just the way Isaac liked it. Then she took Esau's favorite clothes, which were there in the house, and gave them to her younger son, Jacob. She covered his arms smooth and the smooth part of his neck with the skin of the young goat. And she gave Jacob a delicious meal, including freshly baked bread. So she's, I mean, she's pulling out all the stops. I, uh, we'll make sure that it just the house smells wonderful. Everything's going to be great. He's going to just love this. So Jacob took the food to his father. My father, yes, my son. Who are you, Esau or Jacob? It's Esau. I mean, he probably had to, uh, your firstborn son. I have done as you told me. Here's the wild game. Now sit up and eat it so you can give me your blessing. Well, how'd you find it out? How'd you find this so quickly, my son? It was Bambi. You know, it was like uh, right there. Listen to this. This is crazy. The Lord, your God, put it in my path. We'll unpack that in a second. But isn't that crazy talk right there? The Lord, your God, put it in my path. So, so here we go. Mom does all the work. She, does, she takes care of all this stuff. And, he, and Jacob goes and he deceives his dad. He lies about it. He even says, God put the little goat in my path. I mean, you know, he, not only does he lie about it, he invokes God. I mean, how many of us do that where we just, you know, well, we, we know we're doing stuff outside the will of God, but we don't care. And we'll even say, but God wants me to be happy. I think God wants me to ha- be happy. You know, so we'll do stuff way outside the, 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 the guidelines that God has given us because, because we want to be, we think God you know, wants us to be happy, so we can do whatever we want. God wants, you know. So he does all this stuff. He says, you know, hey, boy, come closer. I want to smell you. I want to feel you. Because, you know, well, the food smells good, you know, but I, I'm not, I need to make sure I can't see very well. And so he says, come over here and kiss me. And, and uh, we see that happening here in verse 27. So Jacob went over and kissed him. And Isaac caught the smell of his clothes and was finally convinced. He blessed his son because he knew maybe something was up. And he said, ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of the outdoors, which the Lord has blessed. It's a kiss, really, of betrayal. Just like Judas betraying Jesus with a kiss and all the while justifying his actions. Dad was going to do the wrong thing, so he takes matters into his own hands, thinking that he's going to get the right results. Mom and dad are both wrong. So Isaac has been deceived, and he blesses his boy. And not long after he blesses Jacob, Esau comes home. And uh, he, you know, the, he's, already, he's prepared a great meal and it smells awesome, and Isaac is confused, and what's going on? Who are you? And, and, and he said, I'm your son. I'm your firstborn son. What do you mean, who am I? Nobody cooks like this. And, and Isaac, daddy has a panic attack, begins to shake. His anxiety hits the roof, and Isaac uh, uh, knows that he has blessed the wrong boy, and, and, uh, and he's found out, and he cannot cover his tracks anymore. And what he thought would have stayed hidden when he blesses his oldest boy is now revealed, and he has dishonored his home, he's dishonored God, and he's crushed his son, and he is destroying his family. I thought it was you. 
I thought it was you I was blessing. And, and Esau said, well, well, then just give me something. And, and, and you know, he's like, no, I don't have anything to give. I've already given away the blessing. Esau had been foolish. Before this, we would read that Esau had traded his birthright, his inheritance, for, for some food. He was just hungry. He came home, he was hungry, and there happened to be some soup on the table, and he said, well, can I have some? And he said, give me your birthright. Absolutely, I'll be glad to, and he does. So now Esau responds with hate. He vows to kill his brother. Now he's willing to wait for his daddy to die, and then he will kill his brother, but that's what he's going to do. Verse 41 of chapter 27, from that time on, Esau hated Jacob because their father had given Jacob the blessing. And Esau began to scheme. I will soon be mourning my father's death. Then I will kill my brother. I feel bad, I feel bad, I feel bad. I'm crying. I'm going to go buy a gun is kind of his reasoning. This is horrible, horrible, horrible. Oh, what makes me feel better is the thought that someday I'm going to kill him. So mom even finds out about this plan and tells her son, you better take off and you better leave and you better go to some relatives. And he does. Now, one of the things I truly love about the Bible is they include a story like this. Right? Is it, I mean, because if you were, if you're going to write a religious book on how to do family, this would not be in it. You know, I think oftentimes people think, well, you know, uh, Christians are perfect and, and their families are not messed up and, you know, everything's great and everything goes their way. And, and yet the Bible always reveals that dysfunction started pretty early on the game. You know, it, it, it hasn't got, you know, right? We, we knew Adam and Eve dysfunction, Cain and Abel, woo, you know, and now here we see again a family that's messed up. And if you live in a family that's not dysfunctional, um, I would like to meet you, actually, and then write a case study on that and then have lots of money um, because we all live in messed up homes and messed up lives. A couple of things we notice right away, and this is super obvious. Playing favorites is a bad way to parent. Playing favorites is a bad way to parent. I think it goes without saying, but it happens all the time when a kid doesn't like what you like. Maybe you have a kid that's not so much into sports, but you, were on, you, you played on the football team or the high school basketball team, and, and despite all your efforts to get your boy interested, not interested at all. Uh, but, but one of your boys is, you know, one of your boys is, is really interested in that. In fact, he's kind of good at it. And your other boy loves the arts, uh, but that doesn't interest you at all. Well, where is your time going to be spent? Where is your money going to be spent? Where is all your effort and your attention going to be spent? So your time and energy gets pushed along that side, and it causes all kinds of problems because somebody grows up thinking, hey, I'm the center of the universe, and somebody else says, I, I might as well have not even been born. I can't even get my dad to pay attention. And there's sibling rivalry. It happens all the time. Remember in the Old Testament, the, the story about Joseph and his brothers? They hated him. Why did they hate him? Because his dad played favorites with his boy. Joseph got the coat of many colors. He, he was the prized son. Of, you know, he, he, was gonna, he, he, he got his daddy's attention and his love. And his brothers were so mad, they, want, again, wanted to kill him. And instead, they sold him into slavery, and they got rid of the problem. Brothers get jealous. By the way, this behavior, this kind of behavior gets passed on from generation to generation. And part of what God can do for us is to help us break the cycle of the destructive patterns that plague many of our families. A Christian life is a life of repentance, which allows us to break the cycle. If you were raised in a home where uh, the favorite was not you, you're going to need to have grace. If you were raised in a, in a home where you were the favorite son or the favorite daughter, you're going to need grace as well. Jesus is alive and well, and he, can, he is able to help us and to not only, um, he, he's able to help us forgive and to break the pattern. This is a, I mean, uh, I don't think we know how much damage this stuff can cause. It's powerful. Be careful. Another thing that we notice in the story is that when we give a blessing, it's powerful. 
Genesis 1, 28 says, Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. He's, again, he's talking to Adam. In the very beginning, right at the very beginning, God blesses them. In fact, even God blesses the Sabbath. He says, keep, keep it holy. He blesses even a day. God blesses Noah and his sons. God blessed Abraham. And when Esau doesn't get the blessing, it crushes him. It's devastating and catastrophic. In fact, uh, the way he responds to it is by rebelling. Esau had already married two women. Mistake, by the way, two. Massive mistake. It's not like, right? And not only were there there's two, they were both unbelievers. And he was told not to do it. So now his response to this was to marry more women who were unbelievers. He's like, I'll show dad. He can't, right? I'll show him. Do whatever I want. Take matters into my own hands. You see, when you don't get the blessing, you're going to struggle. Well, I don't want my kids to get a big head. Um, again, this is not in the, a blessing is not fooling them into thinking they're awesome or great. Like they're, they're the best football player ever. I love that. I see that on Facebook all the time or Twitter. Best husband ever. And I want to write back. No, they're not. <laughs> My wife's husband is way better than yours, right? What are you talking about best ever? Okay, because nobody, right, believes that. It's wonderful for you. I don't want my kid, right? Best kid ever. That's just fooling him into thinking that, the, right, that the universe revolves around them. And by the way, if you have a kid that thinks that the universe revolves around them, they will grow up and marry a guy or a gal who believes the same thing about their, themselves. So when you have two people who think the universe revolves around them, what eventually happens is a mess. Well, then they're going to have to marry somebody that will worship them. Well, okay. Uh, okay. You see, there's only one worthy of worship. Now, if you really, and again, uh, parents uh, who make their home a kid-centered home are going to really struggle. You need to make your home a Christ-centered home. Uh, and the best thing you can do for your kids is to not to put them up on a throne and worship them. The best thing you can do is put Christ up on the throne and worship him and make sure your marriage is strong so that the kids even know the most important relationship that we have in this home is with each other. And then we're going to get to you later on there, Billy. Because right now I am right. It's all I'm. I'm. In, I'm so in love with her that I want you to understand how to make right what a great marriage work. All right. Um, but saying things like "You have what it takes," I see this in you. You have. You have what it takes to. Be, you know. And, and again, I always. I always tried to point my kids in in directions they wanted to go. In which I said, you know, if you want to do that, let, let me help you. Let me. Let me come alongside you. I don't understand that world, but I'll, uh, you know, I'm, I'm all about, if you want, I'm all about risk taking. I'm all about like, let's try it. And my kids tried stuff. If they want to do it, let's try it. Uh, and then we knew right away, not good at that. All right, let's move on. Let's, uh, let's try that. I mean, you know, it, and, and that's okay. I, what is risk taking? It is faith. I want my kids to be kids of faith. And I want to put them in the best place possible for all that to take place. Uh, now, if you want really graduate level blessing, if you want to take this to a whole lot, whole bigger level, because it's pretty easy to bless our kids. It's pretty easy. Like, yeah, I can do that. I can do that. I'm pretty good. But Jesus, I want you to bless those who curse you. <laughs> what? Yeah, I want you to bless people who don't like you, don't appreciate you, don't like the way you do stuff. 
Uh, and you know, there are people in your life that do that. There are people You work with them. Maybe it's, you know, right, your neighbor. Maybe there's just certain people in your life that don't like you at all, and they let it be pretty clear. How am I going to bless them? That's graduate level. That's graduate level. Because it's pretty, again, it's pretty easy to bless those we love. Bless those who curse me? Hmm. Now, this is from a writer named Mary Ann Bird. She wrote, I grew up knowing I was different, hated it. I was born with a cleft palate. When I started uh, school, my classmates made it clear how I looked to others. A little girl, misshapen lip, crooked nose, lopsided teeth, garbled speech. When classmates asked me what happened to my lip, I told them that I had fallen and cut it on a piece of glass. Somehow that was more acceptable to have suffered an accident than to have been born that way. I was convinced that no one outside of my family would ever love me. Then there was a teacher in the second grade that I adored, Mrs. Leonard. Annually, we had a hearing test. Mrs. Leonard gave the test to everyone in the class. Finally, it was my turn. I knew from previous years that, uh, that I would stand there and she would whisper in my ear and I would need to repeat it. Usually it was something like this. The sky is blue. Do you have new shoes? So it was my turn. I walked up there and God must have put the words in her mouth that would change my life. Mrs. Leonard whispered, I wish you were my girl. I wish you were my little girl. She spoke a blessing. Teachers, coaches, parents, you had the ability to, to, to change people's lives with even little whispers like that. It's my guess that some of you can look back on moments moments like that in your life when a coach spoke into your life that believed in you and that knew that you had what it takes to kind of maybe you know, maybe it was a teacher saying you know what if you went I think if you go keep going that direction you're really good at this maybe and you can speak words of blessing God whispers that by the way to us all the time I believe in you I believe in you you can do this I can help you. I wish you were my little boy. I wish you were my little girl. Genesis 50 verse 20 says, you intended to harm me, but God intended all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many. This is the great theme of the Old Testament. Isaac meant this for evil. Evil, Rebecca as well. Esau as well. Jacob as well. God meant it for good. Not everything that happens in, in our lives in, in the world is the will of God. Lots of people mean things for evil. We take matters into our own hands. We're sinful and selfish and insecure and scared and angry. But God is a way bigger God than all of those things. And no matter what, uh, our mistakes or our sinful decisions, he is able to craft and mold them all to bring about beauty. The crazy thing about these, these people and this family that we're looking at today is that Jesus is related to them. They're the great, 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 what? There is great, 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 great stuff, right? He comes out of this kind of dysfunction. God came into human history through a family, not a perfect family, but through a family. And the jealousy and the lying and the deceiving and the stealing and the anger, and he puts all that stuff on his back so that we can be forgiven. But not just that, so that we can stop living a life of sin. Maybe you grew up in a home like Isaac and Rebecca's. Perhaps it was worse than that. I mean, you'd have got settled. Oh, this, that'd have been awesome. But my dad was a jerk. He drank too much. My mom cheated on my dad. I don't know anything about a blessing. I don't. I never. I never have heard a blessing from my dad. I never have heard a blessing from my mom. And you grew up in some stuff that was impossible. Impossible to deal with. Jacob probably thought that he would be different than his daddy. 
Jacob eventually would grow up and have a family and do the same thing with his boys. One of them was Joseph. We just looked at that, where there was lying and trickery because you reap what you sow. That God has delivered us from the empty, hollow way that we may have grown up. He does not want you to fall into the pattern of lying and cheating and anger. And he is now helping you be led by the Holy Spirit. And he still whispers into our ears today, I sure wish you were my little boy. I sure wish you were my little girl. He'd like you to be in his family. More than anything else, if, if, if the incredible thing that he, he would adopt me into his home. Again, I, I may have grown up where it was, a lot of things were out of control and lot messed up, and I'm thinking, well, I don't, I don't get this whole family thing because my family was messed up and dysfunctional. Absolutely. But he can walk into that situation and be your heavenly father who will love you and bless you. He will. Jesus, by the way, Jesus even got the blessing from his heavenly father. When Jesus was baptized, the father spoke these words into his son's life, into his ear. You are my son, in whom I'm well pleased. What boy doesn't want to hear that from his daddy? What young woman doesn't want to hear that from a mom? Absolutely. And so Jesus whispers into our ears still to this day, I'm so glad you're my kid. All right. Maybe perhaps you'd like to hear that today. I'm going to give you a moment for him to speak to you right now. Father God, we're going to listen to your voice right now. For some of us, this is a message we've never ever heard of or not thought of, that, we, that you would love us and like us and accept us even after all the stuff we've done, after all the anger, the out of control, the the messed up things we've done that you would whisper in our ears. We just can't even believe that that could be true. That you would want us to be your child. And if that was so true, if that could be for me even here today, that, um, that I would take your hand and say yes to it. Help us to be good parents. It's so hard. Uh, we're, we're Most of the time we're just grasping for stuff and trying to do the right things. And we... We didn't know we had, we didn't our role models weren't so good and we struggled and and uh, so please forgive us and help us maybe to mend some relationships today and deal with some stuff that we've just kind of uh, neglected. Help us to be uh, godly in our in our ways and and if we need to to speak a word of blessing into our kids' lives today, we'll we'll do it. We'll take that chance and speak into their little hearts uh, today. In Christ's name we pray, amen.